Oh, okay. I had no, uh, okay. All right. So it is my very great pleasure today to welcome Dwight Lewis. Um, Dwight is a former student of the University of South Florida, uh, where we, he worked with Roger Ariel and Justin Smith. Uh, he has also had appointments at Emory University and Penn State. Um, and I'm also happy to share that uh, he will be joining uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota, this term uh, starting as assistant professor. Um, so this is our um, third session of the summer. Um, we will have another next month in September uh, about Spinoza by Kim Young Kim, um, but I will share details about that later. For now, let me just renew my welcome to Dwight and um, just give him the mic to get away. Um, thank you all for showing up. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Um, I'm excited for this conversation. Um, you know, it's gonna be super modern focused, just so you know. Um, and I'm going to do something a little different. You know, I, uh, I oftentimes do stuff that's like super, you know, um, historical. And I'm not saying I'm not doing something historical today, um, but I really think this is more about, you know, you, me, and us, um, and why we shouldn't be skeptical, you know, about difference. Um, 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 and that we should embrace it and value it. Um, and that this needs to be something that we talk about also uh, not just in relationship to how we're doing doing uh, doing early modern philosophy, um, but how the early modern philosophers stepped into doing early modern philosophy too, um, and I want to do that in relationship to purpose also. So it's going to be a it's going to be a little broad, a little sprawling, um, but the goal here is to um, move us forward in relationship to how we're how we're actually dealing with the with the early modern canon, right? Um, and I don't want to constrain us in the ways that we're doing it. Oftentimes people are saying, oh, well, are, we, are we doing Western? Are we doing, are we going to dive into global? Are we going to do that? Are we going to do this? Um, I really want to free us. But in freeing us, it means like uh, getting rid of things, right? Uprooting things. Um, and so hopefully we'll see some of that today. Hopefully we'll see some of that today. So I'm going to throw up my slide. Oh, and I, can I um, please have the... Um, ability to share my screen. All right, let's see here. Um, now I just gotta find the right one here. Okay. Share, and then I will go for, oh, is this, I don't know where I'm at now. All right, so here we are, here we are. All right, so skeptical about difference and exploration into inclusive modern philosophy. Um, so my goal here is to start with these three inquiries. Now, where did I acquire these from? It is from, I don't know if you got, if anyone here has heard, um, 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 I'm sorry, I'm also trying to get to the chat and for some reason I can't get to it because uh, I want to send a link. Um, if you have heard um, Stacey Abrams' TED Talk from 2018, uh, and what she does is she inquires into three, she asks three questions that she thinks that we should ask at every juncture our, of our lives, right? Um, and these three questions are, what do I want? Why do I want it? And how do I accomplish it, right? Um, and so I want this to be the ethos or the leading, the leading questions for us as we walk through this talk. Also, um, because I think this is a, a, a similar vein to how the early modernists might have walked through a talk too, right? Um, so first off, uh, what do I want, right? What do I want in early modern philosophy? Why am I here? What am I doing, right? Why do I want to, what, like, what is, what is um, uh, right, pushing me forward? What's pushing me forward? Um, and of course, this is a, this is a picture from a, a, a tempo conference they put on, right? Um, but the goal here is inclusive philosophy for me, um, right? The goal is to have a particular um, understanding of early modern philosophy that is bringing in voices, that is allowing people to be heard and not to be silenced, right? 
Um, now, this is a simple thing. It's like a one word thing, right? Inclusion. Um, but the but the thing the thing that will give you energy even when um, you are depleted is why you want to do a particular thing, right? And I think this is something that's oftentimes lacking. Um, it's a very uh, surface level um, exploration for most. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is grab at some type of depth, at least depth in relationship to me, right? Um, so I'm gonna start here and I have a couple videos. So uh, before the pandemic, um, I, uh, I spent um, about a week, week and a half in Ghana because uh, for those that don't know, I do research on Anton Wilhelm Amo, who's this African who got um, his PhD um, in Germany in 1734. Um, he, uh, he's from Ghana. And so what I did is I went over to Ghana um, to attempt to find oral narratives um, um, about um, what... Uh, people were saying about a mo in Ghana and see if I could. Um, I, I was working on a documentary. Uh, it didn't, it, uh, we've come to, come to find out, you know, most of the information that Ghana has about a mo, at least uh, that we were able, that I was able to get a hold of was actually from the West, wildly, um, of course. Uh, and so I actually wasn't able to find any oral narratives, but I got a lot of good footage. Um, and um, um, I'm going to play one here for us really fast. Think it has been right. There is something more to it. You are not, you are not being told everything. You have something that has been covered. Can't you go back and uncover it? So going to the West confirmed my intuition about me being overshadowed. And now giving me that push to tell the world, I have something. The world must know about it. Right. So the first why here, um, uh, the first reason why here is to uncover those that have been left out of history and philosophy. Because history and philosophy doesn't truly value them. Um, I want to, or I want to even, um, I want to even consider the things that they have to say as being historical or philosophical, right? Um, so uncovering those people, those individuals that have actually been left out of the history of philosophy, right? That's the first why. Um, secondly, globally, and this is one that really got me, um, listening, listening to um, uh, these philosophers talk about the global impact really got me. It is it, said that we think what advice from the West is the best. Always is a kind of inferior quality. So, why, 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 do you, why do you think it's inferior? Do think it's inferior? I don't think it's inferior. Why do we think? It's the matter of colonization. You see, we, we just have to decolonize our minds. Mm -hmm. And until we do that and know that, I just love it because he says, he's like, I don't think that, uh, but that, that is being pressed upon him, right? It's actually the thought is being pressed into him, right? That is what colonization is, right? Is that the idea of being inferior is actually being thrust upon him. Um, and I continue this conversation and Seth, the other, the, uh, the, the one who asked the question, Seth um, uh, tells me, He's like, until um, there's an Oxford handbook on a Mo, we're not going to study him in, the, in, in Africa, right? So I, I literally sat there and I was like, wait, so the colonized can't decolonize themselves except if the colonizer decolonizes them. F. It literally ripped my heart out. And so part of the why is actually the real and true impact that doing this work actually has outside of the West, right? Of actually allowing people um, that, uh, that, uh, that can't do it on their own because um, 
if they want to move up, at least is what Seth said, if we want to like move up in the world, we have to do it based on a Western standard. And so it's doing any type of um, philosophy that's like intrinsically our philosophy doesn't allow us to move up because the West doesn't value that thing, right? So part of the reason why we do this type of work or why I desire to, or why I think we should do this type of work is because of the global impact that it has and the true global impact. This isn't like an imaginary global impact, like that he brought up the Oxford handbook blew my mind, blew my mind. He was like, until that happens, I'm not teaching them. Just to go one step further, I responded to one of his uh, talks and he wanted to talk about doing um, uh, uh, how important it was to do like cultural work, right? R work that was intrinsically tied to Ghana. Um, in a, and he was given a talk in a, um, to, a, to a bunch of PhD students. And the students were, were seriously laughing during his talk. Because it was unfathomable right, for them to even think about doing that type of work, that they were laughing during his talk. I was like, I, I, like, I responded, I was like his responder to this, and I just went off. I yelled at these grad students. I lost it, because uh, I was just like, this is insane. Like, at some point, there has to be evaluation. You have to value yourself but the West has such a chokehold on the world, right? It's difficult to do that. It's difficult to do that. Is and then lastly, something that's near and dear to my heart, right? Um, the local um, and the current, the local and the current, right? So this is a series that was on Netflix, it still is. Um, and it's a series about, uh, um, 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 college football players. Um, and the teacher, she asks is, what is the problem when it comes to black men going further in education? And, and this is one of the football players responses. And I don't, I just got the words at the bottom. Sorry, you're gonna have to read. Right, so this student says, right, um, what is the problem with going further in, um, uh, going further in education as a black male, right? He says the, the, the only thing that majority of black men know is rapping, balling of the streets, right? Entertaining, sports, which is also entertainment, or selling, right? Um, why is this the case, right? When you grow up in the world, right, and you grow up in a particular community, what you usually do is you look around that community and you look at people that are doing well, right? And you're like, I'm going to attempt to go that path, right? Because you can, you can see the path, right? But when you never see the path, it's then really hard to even know that that path exists, right? Please tell me how many black doctors are living in the hood. Please tell me that. Please tell me how many White doctors are living in the hood, brown doctors, lawyers, right? Who's there and who has came from there and coming back? You know, uh, I will say, I know for a fact that the quarterback of, uh, of the Baltimore Ravens was back in the hood. They just had a whole bunch of videos about him and actually they were getting onto him for going back there, right? And saying, you might get hurt. I know, I know for a fact that uh, if you, uh, I got cousins that are in this game, both one and two and three, um, and they're always there, right? Almost every male on my mom's side of the, of the family is, has been to prison or is in prison. Two have not, I think, maybe three. 
right? Because the things that are readily available for you are the, are the people that you can like see in your world and attempt to be like, right? Are doing these particular things, right? So you have to be able to see people that are doing things, right? That are not these type of things, right? So the other why is like trying to give people an image of things that are not these things, right? And then historically, why does, why does inclusion matter? So we've talked about uh, why it matters in relationship to colonialism, why it matters in relationship to our current sphere. Um, also this uncovering aspect, uh, historically, when we talk about history, right? We usually talk about the early modern period being like separated by, you know, the rationalists and the empiricists, and then this God Kant, you know, ties the bow super nice for us. And we're like, oh, lovely, right? Lovely. Um, and even if we like, even if we don't add anyone else, we had no one of color, no women, we leave everyone else out, right? These are still inquiries that were happening all of the time during the early modern time period. It's mind blowing to me. Uh, it, like, uh, if we want to talk about even just the travel logs, you can't read Kant without the travel logs. You can't read Kant without typologies. You can't read Kant without race. Right? But yet, for some reason, this is not important. Right? So we're actually doing an injustice to history when we don't right, step into inclusive philosophy. We're actually doing an injustice to history. Um, so how do we accomplish this goal right, of inclusive philosophy? Right? We said, um, uh, what do I want? Why do I want it? How do I accomplish it? Um, and I, like I said, I really want to talk about broadening the ways that we do this um um uh, because there's multiple different ways to go about doing this um so i used to go about it this way right i said oh well, what we're going to do is we're going to use a mo's philosophy and standpoint and then once he comes in the room we're going to be forced to do this right and i think to some extent it worked it works right um and i want to say it works because um people have been studying them up. People have been actually diving into slavery in ways they weren't diving into it. People have been looking at race in ways that they haven't been, that they weren't doing it in the last three to four years. They really have. But what that does is it puts all the weight of inclusion on the marginalized individual, right? Puts all the weight on them up. And what I want to do is I want to shift that weight, right? Um, I'm trying to shift that weight um, away from a mo, right? And I want to shift that weight uh, to us as researchers, um, um, especially those um, that are doing early modern research, right? So when I talk about being skeptical, skeptical about difference, what I want to talk about is that the modernists were intrigued by difference, right? Through the uh, through the travel logs. There are multiple texts that talk about human difference, women, uh, animals, emotions, happiness, right? Why aren't we, is the question. Why don't we choose to embody this intrigue of difference that we saw in the early modern time period, right? Why don't we choose to embody it? I don't think that, and oftentimes I think that it comes down to the fact that we don't actually understand the power of difference. Um, um, or maybe we do, and we don't want it. We don't want to actually have to grow and change. Or maybe it's as simply as being lazy. But because of this, I want to talk about this uh, skeptical intention, or our own skeptical intention about difference. Right, uh, and I know I'm doing something here. There's not much early modern going on in here. Yeesh, yeesh. 
because what this is, is this, a, this is an exploration into moving into transforming what we understand to be early modern, right? So I'm going to go to James Baldwin also, right? Yes. Um, uh, so in the fire next time, James Baldwin says, to be central, I think, is to respect, to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does, from the effort of loving to the breaking of bread. It will be a great day in America, incidentally, when we begin to eat bread again, instead of the blasphemous and tasteless rubber that we have sub substituted it for, right? So what James Baldwin does here is he makes a distinction between the sexual and the sensual, right? The sexual is going to be that which is surface level. The sensual is that which is depth. The sexual is communication. The sensual is con connection. The sexual is the communication of ideas, right? The sexual is going to be knowledge through vulnerability, right? Not being afraid to, give, to be wrong and, and giving up positions of power, right? And what I wanna say is that if we want to do diversity work well, if we wanna do inclusion work well, what we have to do is we have to start of the sexual and move to the sensual. What do I mean by that, right? So we have to start of the sexual. Um, what we have to do to start of the sexual is that oftentimes when we're doing this work, we're just doing a lot of awareness, right? And that's what I mean by the sexual. Just the presence of death. We throw in a mo on the syllabus, right? We use his skin, right? In the same ways that my skin is used so often, right? I, one job I got, um, I signed my contract and 12 hours later, I was in a video for the department and they had actually kept, they had taken a video of me two years before I got on campus when I was interviewing, two years, right? To post it and talk about the philosophy department, right? Even though I had no, I had no tie to the philosophy department yet. I'd only signed the contract 12, 12 minutes, 12 hours before, right? But we do this exact same thing on our own syllabus, right? We throw a mo on there, but we never talk about race or the depth of it, right? Or the racial problem, right? We barely talk about slavery, right? We've just really been talking about slavery in the last, like, critically for the last like two years, it's insane, right? Why is it that we stay at this surface level, right? What will move us past it? And I think what will help us move past the surface level of just awareness about difference, the presence without depth, is exactly what James, talk, James Baldwin talks about, the sensual, right? And what the sensual does, it, it allows us to be, become aware of our epistemic limitations, right? Why do I say it allows us be, to become aware of our epistemic uh, limitations? Um, because I think when we actually understand difference, when we actually dive into it, what we begin to see is that we are epistemically limited. Why do I say that? Um, because, right, when I look at epistemology in the ways that um, I read, at least standpoint epistemology, we can endeavor to know things, right? Um, and things can be known, right? I can have acquaintance with and, and have knowledge from an experience, um, or I can have um, knowledge of an experience, right? Knowledge of, right? And then acquaintance with and knowledge from. Those are very different knowledge knowings, right? Ones, uh, and we could even go and talk about, you know, something like um, uh, um, um, uh, Frank Jackson, who makes a distinction between uh, the that and the how, right? Um, right, so when we talk about uh, just as propositional knowledge, which we can read about and kind of know about, that's that knowledge, and then this how knowledge, which is experience with, right? and knowledge from that experience, that's the how knowledge. 
there are things that I just can't know how knowledge about, right? I cannot know what it is like to exist in the world as a woman, point blank. I also can't know what it's like to exist in the world as white, right? There are many things that I'm epistemically limited from. And there are knowings that I have, right? Based on my positionality in the world that people that are not like me couldn't have. And I will give you one quick example only because this, this, uh, this has came up a couple of times in, my, in uh, the last couple, uh, um, in, in my, like my last couple of years. Um, but a simple one, I had never, so this is gonna be, maybe this is too intimate, um, but whenever I spent a night at someone's house, I was of the opposite sex. I was never, there was never a fear, never a fear. And I remember two or three years ago, um, talking to one of my friends, about how terrifying that experience really was um, as a woman. An unknown that you've maybe known a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, even six months. You don't know them. But because of my particular privilege in the world of not having to be afraid, quote unquote, of being in that experience, it was just knowledge that's never crossed my mind. Right? I was like 27 before that knowledge even touched my mind. But yet, my friends that were women were forced into that experience, right? And so then they can offer something to people that have to experience vulnerability in a way that I couldn't. You see, hopefully you see that, right? That and Fred, that, and Fred Jackson even says that, that my, it says this, that my how actually increases my that, right? So it's like, you can have all the that knowledge, all the knowledge of, right? And you're still going to be cognitively limited, epistemically limited. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Right, I, I think you do, but right, right um, my experience in the world um, forces particular knowings, right? Or forces me not to be able to experience particular knowings. And those different knowings matter. And when we bring those different knowings to the table, right, what ends up happening is we have more knowledge on the table. So then why would we negate knowledge off of the table, right? So I started here and I say, how do we value difference? First off, we have to become aware of our own limitations, right? There are many of things that I don't know what it's like to not be able-bodied. I remember going on the campus, excuse me, I remember going on the campus at Penn State and Penn State has a huge hill up to their library, a huge hill. And I said, hmm, I walked this thing like nobody's business. And I was like, every person that is not able-bodied here, should they should be required, the university should be required to give them an automatic um, wheelchair because this would be insane. And also because I saw someone rolling up this hill with a wheelchair. And I was like, I'm not gonna lie, I said, fuck. I was like, but I didn't have to know it. And even my knowledge of it now is just that knowledge, right? It's not how knowledge, right? It's not what it's like to spend 20 minutes rolling up that hill, right? Those are different knowings. And from those different knowings, right, different things get brought to the table. 
All right? So I think, at least I've always thought philosophy to be about epistemology. Sorry for those that don't. Uh, I've always thought it to be about knowing, but knowing that is justice creating, right? Eesh. And so then why would we not bring more knowings to the table, right? So you start out with becoming aware. And then secondly, you choose to become vulnerable, right? By accepting the knowings of others. That I don't have to sit back and uh, tell you, oh, let me give you all these racist experiences that I have. Oh. Right? For you to believe me that racism exists. Right? It's like I, I have to always, I have to give a story, right? About being six and walking through a church behind my father and a man and my dad sticking out his hand. And this was actually in, this was actually in Tennessee, right? Um, and the men in that church looking at my dad and shaking their hand, no, right? This is my first experience at six. And it was the first time that I said, you know, I don't wanna be black in the world, right? It's a hard existential crisis to have at six. There is value that comes also from experience that, that crisis at six, epistemic value. That value needs to be brought to the table too, right? But it shouldn't take a story for me to, for someone to believe that racism exists in my life, right? There are things that you can't know, things I can't know. And the goal here is to become aware of those limitations and value the knowledges that other people have, right? and to allow them to bring those things to the table. Then we just got more knowings on the table. It just doesn't, it like, why would you not want more epistemology on the table, right? And so the central is valuing that epistemology that comes from different standpoints. Right? It's actually valuing it because you've become aware of your own limitations in relationship to epistemology and knowing. Right? Just because you've become aware of your own not knowing. Right? And when we look at this chart, there's a lot of not knowing. There's a lot of knowings that are missing. And that men think that they can speak on women's experience in and of themselves is garbage. I don't care how comfortable it makes people feel. And we can talk about this in relationship to race. We can talk about this in relationship to able-bodiedness, we can talk about this in relationship to xenophobia, we can talk about this in relationship to transphobia, right? All those different knowings, not being at this table is a problem. Those different standpoints. And we can only bring them to the table if we value them, right? I don't want them to be used like the sexual. I want them to be wanted, desired, called on like the sensual, right? I want there to be an intimate relationship with them. It's hard because if you don't have an intimate relationship and you don't want to do the work to get one, then stop showing up for this stuff. 
like, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of arguing about whether this matters or not. That's what I'm doing in this entire talk is wasting, wasting breath on something that to me is just intuitive. But it's also, it's intuitive. You know why? Because exactly what I talked about in the last slide, because of my effing standpoint. Because I'm not here. Because I sat in classes with Roger Aryev semester after semester. I said, is there, is there no one that looks like me in this thing? And not just is there no one that looks at me, like me in this thing, but do we not even worry about how people considered people like me in modern philosophy? We just waste our time thinking about rationalism and empiricism. And I kept reading more and more and I was like, are, are you? Even the, even the modernists cared more than about that trash. So it's like, if you're not doing this inclusive work, if you're not doing this like difference work, then you're actually not even being, like you're not being true to the modern period. You're actually ripping the modern period apart. You're doing an injustice. We might as well put the modern period, you know, underneath a tombstone and get rid of it. To me. I think if one of the modernists showed up today and they looked at what we understood to be modern philosophy, they would throw up. Do you know old? Did you know Henry Oldenburg from uh, 1666 until he passed away sent out over almost a hundred inquiries about human difference to seafarers? Oldenburg actually believed that there were scales under the skin that caused blackness. Right? Do you know that Boyle rejected human difference in 1666, at least of the African? You know that the Royal Society had people coming in and talking about, about human difference and race as, as we're talking about in the, in the 1660s, right? But yet none of this matters? All we're going to care about is rationalism and empiricism. No, no, the way that we actually do early modern philosophy is attempting to do early modern philosophy, right? Understand it within its own sphere. And the early modernists was skeptical about difference, right? And what I mean by that is that they were willing to, to like dive into their doubt and tease through it. Something that we're not willing to do. Also because the canon doesn't allow it. Right? So we also have to like, we've got to challenge ourselves but we've also got to reestablish a canon. And, and what I mean by reestablish a canon is I don't want to start another list of people. What I want us to do is dive in to seeing the limitations of our understanding, right? And attempting to show those limitations with depth, right? That leads us to something much different. Right. When we begin to value difference, what we begin to do is say that all these different things can be thrown on the table and we can grow from them, right? It's funny, Leibniz is actually in, um, is in uh, a Mo's logic text, not for anything that has to do with pre-established harmony. It actually is for linguistics. <laughs> right. 
That's what Amon knew him for. <laughs> but yet we've recreated, right? And I think oftentimes, of course, based on Kant, right? We've cre recreated a particular narrative. And what I think we have to do is move past this particular narrative to actually just caring about difference and inquiring into difference in the same ways, in the same ways that the early modernists did, right? And so the question is, what does that, what does that look like, right? Um, and I'm gonna skip this, what does that look like? So I do wanna shout out these two anthologies. I think these are great. Um, Lisa Shapiro's and Marcy's is coming out. The, the PDF is coming out, I think, this month. Um, and then the hard copy is coming out in the spring. Um, I was actually, so they did a, um, a whole, um, like a group that got together and worked on this. And I was actually a part of the Early Modern Philosophy and Anthology. Um, it's going to be, it's, it, uh, you can look at the table of contents. It's great. Um, so I don't want to go there. Uh, I want to give a couple examples of what this might look like, right? And I know I'm going long. I will be quick uh, here. So, you know, I was, I, I'm like, I'm a pup. I'm, a, I'm still a pup, you know, um, and I understand that. Um, uh, and so a lot of what I do is still going to be tied to the ways that Aryev works. Uh, it just is the case. Uh, so Aryev works on a very historical super historical, uh, contextual um, um, movement of ideas. And so the ways that I oftentimes set up my particular class is gonna be in particular in a similar sense. Um, and I'm giving you a course outline um, and I'm taking you through this because I think oftentimes, but I actually wanna talk about the problem. I actually wanna talk about the problem that exists in relationship to women, right? Um, and do it in a way that is still allowing for conversation, right? Allowing for a movement of ideas and a push and a, and a movement that is uh, seamless to, to some extent. And then, of course, I've got this term from scholasticism. Um, yes, yes. I, uh, one of the other things is I don't want to just bring in people that are um, raced or that are women. I also want to show some of these figures. And so this is imagining, right? This is my, you know, 3000 level modern class, just so you know. Um, and so I'm bringing in these people from the, from the fringes, right? Um, uh, and trying to show what actually, um, what actually during the time people were saying about D Descartes in relationship to, um, to scholasticism and his rejection of Aristotle, right? And then we move to the meditations um, and I close this section with uh, Du Chatelet. Why do I close this with Du Chatelet? Uh, because what she does is she gives a beautiful picture of what's going on in the modern period in the preface, right? And in chapter one. And then she brings in people like Newton that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on, but allows me to then talk about Newton, right? Um, for a little bit, okay? Also, her very in the preface at the very beginning, she uh, she like brings one of the first people she brings up is Descartes, and so that's why I make this connection from the meditations to uh, um, to Chatelet, and then causation. Right, I have two critiques of Descartes, right, Elizabeth and Amo, and then we go to occasionalism and pre-established harmony. So I can still give you the same, the like some of the things that are like normative, but also through different lenses. And then this is the big section. This one's harder because um, I've got a lot jammed into this. We've got PSR over here. Um, and I've got Cruzius uh, because I want to have, again, these people that are on the fringes that are not just raced or women, right? And then I also have Wolf down here underneath Spinoza, Spinozism. Um, and I've got Wolf there. Um, because I don't want to use Spinoza to show his, his uh, Spinozism. I want to use what people are saying about him, right? Um, and also, Wolf is someone who's not oftentimes someone that someone's going to read in an early modern 3000 level course. And we've got cause and effect here with Hume and Mary Shepard, right? And then what do I have in here? Critical Black theology, right? Uh, so we've got this uh, African Orthodox 
um, Christian who uh, writes his treatise. And then we've got Lee uh, who is also writing about um, a call to preach, a woman's call to preach the gospel, right? Being a female pastor, right? Not just a female pastor, but also being a black female pastor, right? Um, uh, these are all texts that are pre-1800, right? Um, then we, of course, I just do this because I, don't, I, I actually don't care that much about qualities, but I know that it's important for students to have some type of bearing on it. And so I throw it in here. Um, and the reason, one of the things I do like about this is I bring up Boyle. Um, um, and then I bring up Boyle in the next section too. And so students get a real grasp also on someone like Robert Boyle. Um, and then I end with social issues, right? Um, and the focus of this is I start out with women and then I talk about race. And then I talk about slavery, right? Um, so Boyle touching colors on blackness is his 1767 or 66 work where he uh, does a rejection of, um, of, um, of uh, human difference in relationship to Africa and actually goes through and he cites, he literally cites the particular views and actually quotes them, right? From travelogues. And he says, these are the reasons why these views are wrong, right? This is why the curse of him is wrong. This is why climate theory is wrong, right? It's impressive. This is in the mid 17th century. So when we get to people like Cotton Hume, I'm a little angry, right? because people were pushing back on this well before, 100 years before, right? Um, then we look at someone like Phyllis Wheatley, slavery, look at Locke in relationship to slavery also. Um, Locke in this text wants to say, um, and I'm just giving you a quick overview in this, um, he wants to talk about this. Um, so um, what he wants to say is that the slave that just because a slave becomes a Christian, it doesn't mean that they um, um, they are no longer enslaved. And this, and he uses the example of a marriage. He's like, when I uh, uh, when you become married, it doesn't. Uh, oh, when you become married, it doesn't. Or when you become a Christian, it doesn't. It's not going to null a marriage, right? The legal laws happen outside of religious laws, right? Um, and then lastly, we have Capitone. Um, which I think is a very interesting text um, about the history of slavery. Um, and I think it's really important to this inquiry that I have right now, which is what about the, what is the importance of baptism in relationship to uh, the ways that um, uh, the landscape of human difference shifts, right? Because if we, and I'm giving you way more information, but if we go back, we can actually read in text right, where um, there's this, uh, I for, I'm forgetting the name right now, uh, Richard uh, Ligon um, is in um, Barbados or Jamaica, um, and he is uh, talking to a slave, and the slave's like, I want to become a Christian, um, and so the, the uh, uh, Richard is like, oh, well, let me go talk to your slave, your owner. He goes and talks to his owner, and his owner's like, no, I'm not going to make him a Christian because if I make him a Christian, then I'm going to have to free him, right? Um, and so this idea of baptism in relationship to slavery is super important. It's something I'm trying to figure out, but it's a scary topic because it's all over the place. Um, now, syllabus two. I'm going to go quickly, I promise you. Um, Julie Walsh has a really interesting syllabus, and I'm just going to really show the beginning, and I'm going to flip through the side slides. So she tries to in embody this... Um, the modern understanding of questions, right, of difference. How should we live? What can we know? What are we, right? And this is how she attempts to show, show difference, right? And so how do we live? She's got all of these people talking about happiness, about um, constraint, about learning, about inquiry, right? How should we live? Um, uh, what do we know? If you look here, it's still very uh, traditional, uh, which is awesome, but we also have Jacques up here. Um, who's also this uh, Ethiopian. Um, 
And then we've got, what are we, right? And again, we've got another Ethiopian in there. We've got Descartes, we've got a Mo. And you see how she puts a Mo on there and she doesn't just put a Mo on there, but she also puts right after a Mo on the difference of human, of human races, right? There's a depth that's taking place there, right? It's not just like, oh, a Mo, um, after the other human mind, right? But she's actually giving us a depth there, right? This is the type of work that I'm talking about, where it's not just that you're using these particular figures, but you're actually talking about the problem of being different, right? The problem of actually being different. Um, so I'm gonna end with the Baldwin quote because I am obsessed with Baldwin and it is what it is. Um, um, yeah. Um, um, and here we are at the center of the arc, trapped in the gaudiest, most valuable and most improbable water will the, wor the world has ever seen. Everything now we must assume is in our hands. Oh. Is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and relatively conscious blacks who must like lovers, like sensual lovers, right? Insist on or create the consciousness of others. We have to create this consciousness of others, insist on it. That's what I'm doing here, right? Do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial, sexual, um, uh, ableist nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. All right. But we have to make people aware, conscious of the thing, right? We started awareness, right? Um, and I even did it here, right? When we talked about Baldwin, right? It's starting at awareness, starting at the sexual and moving to the sensual, right? We have to insist on an awareness and then push to a sensual change. And that sensual change is it exists in a willingness to be vulnerable. Vulnerable about our own knowings and vulnerable about the knowings of other people. My students bring up a couple of things in my class at the end of every semester. One of the things they bring up first is that, I, uh, is that at the end of this class, I was able to speak because I felt like this class was a family at the end. Because I start with things like Brene Brown and willingness to be vulnerable in the classroom, right? And then I implement, and then I actually like do it, right? At times I say, you know what? That's a great question. I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna think about this for two days. And when we come back on Thursday, like we'll start the question, the, we'll start the conversation there. And I don't want to be the only one going home and doing this. Everyone go home and do this. Right. But as philosophers, we want to know. And we want to show that we know. Right. So arrogant. We are just so arrogant. It's hard to get people to want to be conscious of you when you're arrogant. What would it, what would it mean, right, to actually walk into a classroom a little broken? I promise you more students will become philosophy majors. I promise you, your budget would increase. <laughs> the reason I, that part of the reason I know this is because they had an astronomical jump in the amount of black philosophy students as soon as I started teaching as a, as a grad student. My chair told me. Are you going to allow people, are you gonna not just allow, but push people to be conscious 
of the existence of others. Guess what? The arguments don't exist in a vacuum. They don't exist in a vacuum. They are socially and contextually constrained. Does the social and the cultural matter in your classroom? I don't know. But I think it would matter in a early modern classroom. Tom doesn't start at the history for no reason. Why don't we? Right? Well, clearly, no, I'm not even going to say that. Well, I'm not even going to say that. I don't know if we're actually. I don't know if we're actually getting smarter. Right? Um, how are you positioning yourself? How should you position yourself as a means of justice created in a relationship to difference? What I wanna say is if we value difference, then we don't need all these parameters of like, oh, well, maybe I should put this, like, oh, uh, uh, is it Western? Is it this, is it that, right? If we just value difference, then we will just put difference into the syllabus, into our courses, right? But the thing is, is that we just don't value it. We truly don't. We want to, we want to give off the, it's like, we want to give off that we do. We show up to the feminist club to make it seem like we care about women, right? But you keep taking advantage of women every day, right? It's the same thing here, the history of philosophy. I want to make it seem like we care, throw the MO on the syllabus, talk about it a little bit. But we position ourselves in relationship to justice by actually being about difference. And being about difference is about being aware and accepting that we can't know particular things and being vulnerable in that space to be okay with it. Last thing here, I'm going to let you go. Um, um, Jose Medina has a book called The Epistemology of Resistance, right? And he talks about um, two different sides. He talks about those that are um, um, oppressed and the oppressor, right? And the oppressed has an intuitive uh, bent towards humility, towards inquiry. The oppressor has a bent towards arrogance, right, and ignorance. The oppressor. What can they learn from those small people? <laughs> right? What I want to say is that there's much to be learned. But you have to understand that there's a bunch that you don't know. I know it's hard to hear as a philosopher. The start of positioning yourself to create difference is accepting your not knowing about difference, right? I appreciate you, I do. I know this is a different type of talk. I appreciate you for being here, 100%. Um, I know this is a very different type of talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, I I actually remember you giving a talk at the Minority and Philosophy Group uh, at Birkbeck in London a while back, and um, I see also how how your thinking is is developing, and uh, it's, it I really appreciate it. Thank you uh, for all the work you're doing in this area. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions now. We have about 20 minutes until we hit our usual one and a half hour mark. Um, so 
you can you're welcome to write them in the chat or also um, just take up the floor if you want. Also, if you also if you have, uh, I'm 100% down with uh, people that have syllabus recommendations too. Um, what are things that you're doing in your classroom that would be helpful for other people to hear or even myself included? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if who's actually teaching modern, you know, um, but this was, this is a modern, you know, um, uh, group. So I was hoping a lot of people would be. It is. Oh, and then Michael. One of the things, just a comment that I think is worthwhile making, and that uh, as many of you know, I've been working, my entire work is on retrieving N, not the, but N other Aristotelian, materialist Aristotelian tradition through the suppressed or repressed uh, Islamic and Judeo Arabic tradition. And as I like to put it, any friend of Averroes, so Ibn Rush is a friend of mine. Uh, and it was repressed by for ecclesiastical political reasons, not for any philosophical reasons in intrinsic. One of the things that I suggested is worthwhile looking there because the issue of women, race, etc., come into it as well, is the way in which what we call the canon of philosophy or Western philosophy is already overdetermined like you want to talk about standpoint, absolutely overdetermined by ecclesiastical political concerns. In other words, the theological political as yeah. the formation, as it undergirding the entire formation of the canon, because it's not just Aristotle, okay, but even Plato. I mean, it's really, it's not until we get to Ficino that we get the soul is the whole man. Plato is not a Platonist. Okay, if you go to the symposium, the most erotic of erotic dialogues, but play it, in other words, the very condition of accepting classical philosophy into the canon was baptism, really by baptizing them. And I think that that will determine the extent to which, I mean, even how we'll see women, yeah. uh, how we'll see race, etc. I mean, only Kant talk about no experience to the contrary would convince me otherwise. His personal physician is a Jew. Okay. <laughs> Maimon, the greatest comment, one of the greatest commentators is a Jew. Okay, Mendelssohn is a Jew, but Jews are a nation of cheaters and liars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that happens that's worthwhile looking at, <coughs> at two levels, I would call, when Robert Berlusconi initially started working on Kant and Kant's racism, the outrage was fantastic. And when I published my first book on Maimonides and St. Thomas on the Limits of Reason and showed the extensive Islamic and Judeo Arabic influence on Thomas, not just on law, somebody, a very prominent person at Notre Dame, philosopher, said to his students, refute Dobbs Weinstein. Well, <laughs> they haven't succeeded yet, but no, but the whole point was that was, and if you look at the traditional histories of even medieval philosophy, not just modern, what you, you see no Islamic philosophy, you see no Jewish philosophy, you see Ibn Sina, why? Because Ibn Sina can be absorbed in some way into Thomistic, <laughs> into domestic metaphysics, but that's it. And even when Steve may grade, even when we get the Cambridge Companion to medieval philosophy by Steve may grade, there's one chapter on Islamic philosophy by Teresa and There's one on Jewish philosophy by yours truly. And the rest is Christian philosophy. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So I think that really, looking at, I mean, really troubling the canon, it really needs to also trouble it theological, politically. Yeah, yeah. Really, yeah. I mean, if anyone knows that, that's Baldwin. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Baldwin is brilliant on it, okay? Yeah, I, agree. I mean, he's brilliant about it. I include him as a critical theory and I teach 
writing it. I mean, to me, he is the, still the greatest critical theorist. I agree. I agree. Absolute, absolutely. More so than, I mean, he see Coates doesn't come close to him. Anyway. Not even close. Like, no, not no, even no, close. But, uh, that's, but he's brilliant in terms of why do, yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. I, I mean, I, uh, I, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I love teaching him. I mean, he is, he is absolutely, in terms of the critical edge, in terms of the way in which Christianity determines okay, what African-American consciousness. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yes, 100%. It is, it, yes, yes, yeah. Anyway, so again, I think that emphasizing the theological political is really important. important. No, I appreciate that. I, and I'm like, this is the work I'm really like, I'm actually, what I gave today, I'm really, to some extent, not that I'm moving away from it, but I am moving away from it. Um, and I'm trying to really focus on this baptism now. I think that baptism matters so much. Um, and I think this is a way that then you force these type of conversations um, because the, 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 yeah, yeah, the theological and political matter. Um, really the baptism of Aristotle, yeah. They're so intertwined. Aristotle, because the scholasticism they're talking about that we are presented with in the 17th century is not Aristotle. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, it's yeah. not okay. Aristotle. Even the, even the, the baptism of Africa in its in um, in uh, the in the Roman um, oh without a doubt the Roman Rome reconquers it literally in the Justinian corpus it says that they experienced a rebaptism yeah right? oh yeah no but, one of the things I love until recently the confessions always had a white Augustine only recently did we get a picture of Augustine who is black. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Augustine's mother was not at all white. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, even there, you've got the really whitewashing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certain forms of baptism. Uh, but mm -hmm. inclusion in the canon via baptism understood slightly, I mean, metaphorically, yeah. Mm. yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for your talk. I love it. And, Unfortunately, I've got to go and teach a student in China. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm supervising a, an MA thesis and she's in China and I've got to meet her. But thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending and see you next one. Bye. Thank you, Edith. Um, thank you. So I think uh, Michael had his hand up and then Andrew. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Dwight, for the presentation. Um, uh, first, I want to ask, uh, the syllabi you mentioned at the end, your syllabus and I think Julie's syllabus, yep. are, are, are those available online or is there so, a way we could get that? So if you put your email in here, I will email it to you. I will uh, okay. email it to you. Okay, Actually, okay. you know what? I will try to, you know what? I'm going to put it on my academia account. I will put it on my academia, but if you please give me your email and I will email it to you also. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I, I have a, 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 a supporting observation and also a question. Uh, yeah. um, I saw that you had uh, on your syllabus, there was a, a section on skepticism and that's important. I think skepticism is really important in the early modern period, of course, especially for the appreciation of difference, right? Yeah. Uh, not so much the skepticism as Descartes discusses it. Yeah, I agree. But, but more like uh, Montaigne, as you had in your syllabus, and also Bale, the kind of Peronian skepticism where there's a spirit of inquiry always, right? You said the oppressed, uh, you, as you mentioned at the end, uh, the oppressed uh, have a spirit of, of inquiry or are bent towards inquiry. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's, I think, a spirit is also uh, that's uh, present in Peronian skepticism. Agreed. And I think that the Peronian uh, themes throughout the early modern period, and Popkin is really good at bringing this out in his work, but other people too. And you find this to some extent in, as I said, Bale, Huey, um, even Hume is more of a Peronian than might be thought, right? So. Um, and he was, he was interested in difference. He didn't get it right, of course, but <laughs> he, he was interested, in, he was interested in the question, but I think that the more that the Peronian skeptical theme in early modern can be emphasized, I, I think that would go a long way towards uh, the appreciation of difference in some of the ways that you were suggesting. So um, this is not inconsistent, inconsistent with anything you said, it's supporting. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had a question though. Um, uh, you spoke very well about epistemic limitations and we should appreciate our epistemic limitations. And this is in keeping with skepticism. And um, you also, also uh, said that there are certain kinds of knowledge we just can't have. We, we can know that something is the case, but may not know how, right? So there's kinds of ways in which some kinds of knowledge is maybe limited to one given one standpoint. Um, and I like all that. But at the same time, you said that we should bring different knowledges, different kinds of knowings to the table. Yeah. But what is it to bring the different knowings to the table if they're sort of, in the other kinds of knowings are inaccessible to us? So it's, it's, it, there's a, uh, not a tension, or maybe it's a kind of tension or a paradox there. On the one hand, different knowings are inaccessible to us. On the other hand, we should bring them to the table. So, yeah, yeah. so, so no, 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 I think all of this is great. I really appreciate it. Um, and I was, I agree with you 100% about the skeptical inquiry. That's where I was. So I started out this talk and I gave the title and that's what I was going to go actually exactly what you said. But then I reread, I reread a bunch of Popkins and I said, Popkins, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, I think that his, he's just so heavy footed with skepticism. Um, and I don't want to be as heavy footed with him. So I like the way that you're bringing up the Peronian skeptics which is skeptical about inquiry and not skeptical in, qua skepticism, right? Um, that's like, it's a skeptical with a, uh, with a, with a, with a intention, right? It's intentionally skeptical. Um, now this question about epistemic limitations and the that and the how. So um, what I would say is that as, especially as a professor, right? there are going to be those in your classroom that may have how knowledge, right? Uh, that is related to that thing that you don't have how knowledge about, number one. Um, number two, um, just because I don't have knowledge how about a thing doesn't, doesn't mean that I shouldn't endeavor to have knowledge that about a thing, right? Um, just because I don't, I can't have experience, just because I can't, like, let me give you an example. Just because I, I may not have experience with riding a bike, doesn't mean I can't have knowledge about how one rides a bike, right? Um, meaning uh, just because you don't play football doesn't mean you don't have a real bent and you don't bet on football. And so then you're like, oh, I need to know as much as I know about football as I can know about football, but I just don't have the how knowledge of football. You see what I'm saying? Um, and so I think that, that that, like, just because I am distanced from the how doesn't then mean that I should not inquire into the that, right? Um, and I think that the that, even, even, even if I can't know it fully, right? I can't know it, meaning, and what I mean in the knowing is it's a different type of knowing. I can know it propositionally, right? I just can't know it experientially, right? In relationship to sensations, right? But I can know it uh, in relationship to, um, to um, um, uh, propositions. Right. And also, right, these things are inextricably tied to each other. So if we want to talk about something like race, even though you may not have how knowledge of experiencing race, you experience the other end of that spectrum. Right. And so having how knowledge and then having information about that knowledge is helpful. Right. Um, in the same way that uh, I can't exist in the world with having that, without having that knowledge about white people, right? But white people get to exist in the world all the time without having that knowledge about black people, right? Um, and so it, it, for me, if we, if we don't accept these epistemic limits, limitations and endeavor to know more that knowledge about how knowledge that we don't know anything about, we're actually continuing to do epistemic injustice, right? Um, and the, and the reason I say this is because more, more weight, and this is why I wanted to leave or move away from like a Mo being the center point for this change, right? Because then more weight gets put on the diverse person. More weight gets put on the woman. More weight gets put on the, uh, the non-able-bodied person, right? Um, and so how do we... How do we exist in such a way where we can take on some of that weight, right? Um, and you can't take on that weight unless you're aware of the weight, right? Um, and that doesn't mean you have to feel it, right? Um, 
I, I'm not gonna lie, I really can't feel my students anymore. My, um, my undergrad students, when they come to me and they tell me how hard it is to write one of their seven page papers, I'm like, mm, I've read your papers and they're just not great, but, I, but I'm trying really hard to like step back into myself from like seven, well, really like 10 years ago. And it's just not, it's not possible anymore, right? Um, but I still listen to them and I'm like, oh, I feel so bad for you, right? Um, and I try to learn from that, right? Um, and make things better in the future if I can, you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, it does make sense, that's very helpful. But I was wondering whether in, uh, if knowledge that and knowledge how maybe not as separate maybe you can get closer to knowledge how right there there are lots of theories about the relation between knowledge how and knowledge that and some theories say that knowledge how is continuous with knowledge that so and, and some theories say no this is a radical difference like uh, mm -hmm. Gilbert Ryle for yeah, example yeah. so th there are different theories of the relation between knowledge how and knowledge that so and yeah. some of them have more continuity than others and I just wonder how that might apply to some of this but oh well, yes what, what you said is very helpful so I'll go back to um, something like, um, you know, I, I've already brought up the Mary argument, right? So let's go, let's, let's talk about the Mary argument a little bit here, right? Um, um, does, does, does Mary learn something from, like, is there some type of learning that takes place? Not, is it physical or non-physical? I give, I give zero yes. fucks about whether it's physical or non-physical, right? Is there a learning that takes place? That, that there's a debate about that, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking you, Michael. Do no. you think? Do you think? No, I don't want another debate. Do you uh, think? No. I think, I think, if you had complete knowledge, that you then, could intuit a color. You could, if you have complete knowledge, you should be able to intuit color experiences. Yes. Yes, well, it depends on your theory of intuition, but yes, that's what I think. So, so, but that's at the limit, right? That's we're From not propositional in... knowledge. You can intuit. You can intuit the experience of red in the world. You can intuit it from propositional knowledge. Yeah, I, I can't because I don't have enough propositional knowledge. Right. right. Anyway, I mean, the other people have questions. I don't know, but the, this is a, this is a really interesting debate. Uh, uh, so, like, I can't do it. Um, but uh, but in principle, someone with enough propositional knowledge can someone it. have that much propositional knowledge? That that's a good question, right? Maybe God could, or maybe an infant, so, right? So, so God, so then it's not a human, so it's not a human thing, then. right? So yeah, the, right. The, these are these. Are, so what should we aspire to, right? Should we aspire to that kind of God perspective or not, right? That's that's just, that's a big question. Yeah, I agree with you, Michael. I do hear you. I do hear yeah. you. I do. I just am one of those that I think like what we do in philosophy is we like um, we get in our own way, right? Um, we create problems that like don't exist, right? Um, instead of being on the ground, and that's why our students are running out of the departments. Yeah. Right? That's why we've got, you're at a, a school with 60, 70,000 students and there's a hundred philosophy majors, right? Um, it's like, what? But it's because our, not, what we're doing is just not tangible, it's not on the ground. And so what I'm, I guess I'm trying to do here is like, give people, you know, food to eat. Yeah. Um, um, and, I, uh, and I think philosophy for a long time hasn't given people food to eat especially not people that are different. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do agree with you about all of the that and the how. Uh, in theory, in theory. I agree about the theory 100%, Michael. I do. Uh, but I just don't get to, you know, I don't get to it. So I'm talking too much, but I don't get to exist in theory. All right, my blackness doesn't get to exist in theory. I have to experience it every day, right? When I walk in the classroom and two weeks later, my students come up and apologize to me about being racist because they saw me come in and teach for the first day and they were like, fuck this guy, right? I just get to have to experience it, right? So I don't get to like, be like, oh, let me sit here and theorize about, you know, my experience of blackness. Like it just smacks me in the face um, or my experience of the world. Um, I'll give you, I'll, I'll even give you one more. 
Um, some of you may have already heard this. I, uh, last APA that was in person, I was at, I think it was in Vancouver. Um, I'm out, I walk outside to smoke a cigarette. I'm sorry, I smoke, Lord help me. <laughs> so I walk outside to smoke a cigarette. It's like, it's like midnight. I walk back in and you know, like a good black, I wave to both concierge. I'm like, hey, the black guy's coming in. Like I have to swipe my card to get in because it's a, the West End. So it's, you know, $1,000 a night, not really, but whatever. So I swipe my card to get in. And then I go and sit down in the lobby and I'm sitting down in the lobby and I'm on the phone with one of my friends. The manager walks by about five minutes later and I say on the phone, I'm like, they finna check my ID and see if I stay in this hotel on the phone. Five minutes later, manager walks up. He says, can I have your room key and your, and your ID so I can check and make sure you stay in this hotel, All right? So just showing up to an APA conference forces me into a position of violence. Right, being committed on me, and so I just don't have time to sit around and talk and talk about what about what if I was God? I it's like I don't get the option to ever be God, right? I don't get the option, like because I've got to deal with the fact that it's like I'm experiencing annihilation when I show up to do my job, right? It's like what in the like I'm sorry, and this is something I'm going. This is something that I would say to to, to black people. Like, who, what type of Black person going to be in the Westin and not be able to pay for the Westin? None. Black people don't show up in really expensive places and not being able to pay for it. Like, the Black people that show up in those really expensive places usually have more than enough money. Right? Just, just from, like, social experience. Right? So it's just mind blowing, right? But it's because that person didn't have enough that knowledge, right? They had, had a different brand of that knowledge. And so what I wanna do is give people more of that knowledge. So hopefully those experiences won't exist. I'm not expecting them to be intuitive. I'm never expecting a white person to get to how knowledge about blackness, right? In the same way that I struggle every day with like my knowledge about being a woman in the world. I'm sorry, if it's not a daily struggle for you, then it's like, you're, you're lying to yourself as a male, right? Like I take for granted being a male all the time. All the time, sorry, I keep talking. Um, I know we're over the time. I'm sorry, I'm over the time. Uh, but I do want, I'm going to do this. We're going to stay over. You can leave if you want. But I know Andrew had his hand up. And so I've got to hear what Andrew has to say. <laughs> sure. I was going to actually, sorry about the echo. But uh, if we're going over time, we're already going over. I mean, I, I had a few examples I was going to bring up. Bring them, bring them. In, in the guise of what you were saying about this is how they were doing modern philosophy. This is, these are the conversations that we're having. And it's something that comes up in Eze's book on Kant. Uh, Bernasconi talks about it on Hegel. I mean, a lot of people are talking about it. Um, obviously, it's, been taken, it's not taken up by everybody in every journal, you know, which is you know, unfortunate to an extent. But, you know, you had Kant teaching the anthropology, which is, as we all hopefully know, extremely deeply racist, more than the course on metaphysics, more than the course, the lectures on ethics that Herder recorded. Right, you had um, Hegel in the philosophy of history, the lectures, where he starts off by saying, right, Africa is like obscured in the mantle of night and it's, you know, it has no history except for uh, Egypt. The only reason he considers Egypt, he considered it um, as part of the Oriental world, right? So he immediately, he goes to Africa and leaves it in the same breath. Um, I mean, there's Hume, I can keep going, I'm gonna keep going. There's Hume on the Laplander, the Negro, and the first yeah, critique. Yeah. Yeah. Hume on, on women and the cheetah. I mean, there's tons of stuff, right? But oh, yeah, yeah. So, as you were saying, and I'm just reiterating something you already said, there's nothing new being added here. The way they were doing modern philosophy pay a lot of attention to issues, right? Gendered and raised people. Yet we get to um, the typical syllabi and we get to the discussions being had in journals and things of that nature. It's trash. I mean, yeah, it just flat, nothing. I mean, so I guess th there's no question there. 
I lost my thread, but I, I just, what you, everything you've said so far to me has just been intuitive. Yeah. From, yeah. from going through it and, and having to, right, teach the first critique to students, or the first critique, the first inquiry to students, and then you get to the part on the lap letter and the Negro. What yeah. do you say? <laughs> do you just do you just act like it isn't there? Do you yeah. just, he was obviously thinking about these things, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. it's just it, it's baffling, right? In, in, in light of your presentation, there's no way we can ignore this. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Yet it's being covered over so Not much. And and indeed, she's actually my advisor. She just left, but one way she puts it is the history of philosophy is a history of the victors, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I guess I'll I'll end it with that. I don't know if you have thoughts, but. No, Andrew, the beautiful thing about what you said that was awesome was that it, uh, it really connects to um, uh, the valuing of difference, right? I think the reason you saw it is because you're aware of difference and you value difference, right? Um, that's why it was intuitive for you. And it's a beautiful thing. It's like, that's like, you are the epitome of the thing that I'm trying to get people to be, right? It's like, yeah, it just makes, it's like, yeah, I'm aware of difference, right? And I value it. And so when I read the text, there's no way that I'm going to be able to read it without being attuned to these particular things, right? Um, and so then we don't have to tell people, hey, your syllabus needs to look this way or needs to look that way. Because this stuff is just all over the modern period, right? Um, and so that's why it's like, I love what you said, Andrew, because that's exactly how I felt reading uh like reading when I was especially a grad student reading through I was like this is just insane right um and I didn't even bring this up last thing I'll, and then I'll let um Alberto go uh, but Locke even talks about he's like oh about how easy it is um for a white child to be racist right and it's like how has Locke scholarship existed for 300 fucking years and no one's wrote about this. Like Locke literally says, oh, well, if I take the central attributes of a human to be these particular things, and then I run into a Negro, then I easily intuit that Negroes are not humans, right? He just says it, clear cut. And it's mind blowing that it's like, what were Locke scholars doing for the last year? And you're just like, then, what that tells me is they're not reading the inquiry. Like they're not reading it. But you know, a lot of scholars be BSing. I'm gonna just call it like it is. Everyone, they, all these people are such great scholars. And it's like, but they ain't read diddly squat, right? It's like, wait, hold on. Yeah, I'm not even going I don't, yeah, I don't get, the opportunity of showing up without doing thorough dynamic research on a mo. So much so that I've been like, right, I went to Africa for it. <laughs> right. These other scholars just citing secondary sources, never reading the main sources, can't even touch Latin. It's like, what are we doing? Like what? At least that's a pop, like, make a movement towards it, right? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, but if I show up, I'm not able to do that stuff, you know? Back of the line, same as you, Andrew, same as you. <laughs> um, I know I know that we're over time. You can leave if you wanna leave. Um, I'm down with staying. So just uh, know that you can leave whenever you wanna leave. Um, yeah, 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 free yourself. <laughs> Alberto, Alberto, where have I, I seen you before? Mm, I, I don't really know. I've seen and you somewhere before. Probably I know another meeting, no online meeting. Could be, yeah. I don't know. Right now I'm in Mexico City. I mean, I'm, I'm Mexican, so I, I'm not really know. I don't, I'm not sure, but that could be. I mean, there are many, there are plenty of online meetings, you know, right now, so. I've seen you. I'm writing your name down. I'm going to Google you and email you because I've just seen <laughs> it and I'm like, I, yeah. Yeah, everyone. Of course. Just, you know, it's, it's very brief. Just I was thinking that you were saying uh, in your talk and well, you know, now, I mean, now I'm in Mexico and teaching in Mexico is more, it's 
the situation here is different than the states, of course, but at the same time is, is quite similar. You know, we consider the, the indigenous tradition, of course, the black, the black people here in Mexico, that is a, is a very uh, small community, but it exists. But we have, you know, this Western tradition that is uh, considered the, the other traditions that, like they always undervalue. So in, in my experience, the only way that the students can, can, can value these other traditions, sometimes their own traditions, is, is, is reading them. They need to read the text, you know? So I, I was thinking uh, just in, in some of your, your slides, I don't, I don't remember exactly, you were quoting, uh, probably was the, the, slide, the volume model three, I think so, I, I'm not, I don't remember exactly. And, and just it was Amo or Descartes and, and you quote some uh, Sor Juana. Sor Juana was a, a, a Mexican, a New Spain poet and whatever. So I, I just I was thinking just uh, it's important in my case, but could be in yours also, uh, you know, to remember the school of Salamanca in the 16th century. This was very important during the 16th century. In I think so, that was the first time that the, the Europeans, the great scholars, discuss and have debates. They not in, in that moment they not only publish one book or, or a single treatise. They really have a, a intellectual debate about the difference between black people, indigenous people, and of course the Europeans during the 16th century. The most famous was Las Casas and Sepúlveda, but it was only, only one step in, in, in this debate during the whole century. And, and this is very important because in my opinion was like the first moment that the Europeans said, hey, come on, let's, let's talk about this seriously. But unfortunately, you know, the human rights and, and uh, uh, use gentium was like like rights of, of citizens. I mean, it's, the, it's a new translation. I don't know how to say uh, right now. But unfortunately, the, the Spanish tradition in my, is, is undervalued. Yeah. So it's like, it doesn't really matter. We, in modern philosophy, we usually, we, we study Hobbes or, or sometimes Jean Baudin, uh, Locke, of course, but the Spanish tradition is like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's not really important. But from not right now, I'm in Mexico, but even considering in other, in other countries, I think it's very important because it was a, a, a first, the first moment, as I said, you know, that we have really, a, a really important debates. I have to consider again, recover these debates and see that it was a, a very important moment in the history of, of, of Western tradition of philosophy. And don't forget that, that that kind of debates are not really new. Sometimes could be new for us, but if we really check the history of philosophy, we can find really important moments like, like that in the 16th century. And I, I, I was just thinking that it's important to recover, you know, that, that these important moments in the history of philosophy that some philosophers really consider, really try to understand the other. I mean, with their, their concepts, with their elements during the 16th century, of course. That, and, and that's all, that was very brief and, and I don't want to take your time, you know? No, that was awesome though. I like this idea um, that she said at the end, especially, which is understanding the other, you know, I oftentimes talk about it in, re in, re in relationship to difference or human difference. And I like, I think some people may understand this better, understanding the other, um, even, I think it makes it even more clear. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, uh, I agree with you. The Spanish tradition is usually just left out, left out. Um, just like, you know, the, yeah, 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 yep, it is left out. Um, so now we just, now we need your, uh, what we need from you is a uh, Spanish early modern in, anthology. That's what mm -hmm. I'm looking for you, from you in the next yeah, five years. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm being, like, I know it's fun, it's, it is funny, but I'm being serious too. No, no, no. Like, um, and if you need help with it, let me know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I'm not like I'm saying not that I can help build it, but at least connect you with people that might be willing to publish something mm -hmm. like that too, because these are the type of things that we've got to, you know, we've, if we're going to change it, we actually have to, you know, put this stuff out there for other people. Mm -hmm. to read. Um, yeah, of course, we need uh, to consider different sources of, and yeah. different traditions to try to really understand the other, you know, the other position, the other stance. Otherwise, we are, you know, we're building some a new tradition, but on, on the same. Under the same, I don't know, on, on the same way that the, the 
if, we, if I can use that word, the dominant tradition is, is, is you know, the important or, or the way to do it now is to just to try to understand the other, the differences, the new traditions, and, and to have the same value, all the same value, you know, and this is very important stance, well, for me. You know? Yeah, me too, me too, me too. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm going to email you. I'm going to email yeah, of course. you. Um, Thank you for your talk again. No, 100%. Thank you for coming. This is, this is, this is really what I'm about, you know, um, how can we actually change the landscape, right? Um, and you do it by actually like giving people things to be able to change the landscape with. Um, and so you've got epistemology that I don't, the, the reason I'm coming to you and saying this is because no one's really given me epistemology that I don't really have yet. And so I'm coming to you and I'm emailing you because you've offered epistemology that I don't have. And I respect the difference that you bring to the table. And I know how valuable it would be to have that on the table. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to do is actually live out the thing that I said today. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. But all right, all right. Thank you all for coming. This has been great. If you have any other questions, please email me. Please email me. Um, yeah. So on behalf of Vanderbilt, I'm going to uh, thank you all. Um, I'm going to thank especially Dwight for a wonderful presentation and a great discussion and conversation. Um, this was great, honestly. Um, what we do must always be not just talking about philosophy, but talking about meta-philosophy, reflecting on the ways we do philosophy and how they inform our results. So thank you once again. And um, the first week of September, the first Wednesday of September, we will have the concluding event of the summer, uh, Kim Young's Kim talk on Spinoza, and I hope to see you all there. And um, you'll find this on YouTube, by the way, on our channel. And um, I'm just going to wish you all a great night. And thanks again. All right, peace, peace. Everyone have a good one.